Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining my coworker Hannes and myself in this session about scalable predictions of deep learning models with Apache Beam. Uh, so we're very happy to be invited here uh, at Beam Summit and uh, engage in this wonderful community. Uh, we have heard uh, so many interesting talks uh, for the past two days. And uh, so here we are today to share with you how we use Apache Beam uh, for deep learning predictions um, and share with you some of our learnings. Uh, so uh, my name is Joe Pu. Uh, currently, I am focused on data engineering and ML infrastructure at Digit Financial. In the past, I've built experimentation infrastructure for embedded tweets at Twitter and various self-service analytics and data pipeline tools at Microsoft. Hi, my name is Hannes. I'm a machine learning engineer here at Digit. I'm also a Google developer expert for machine learning. And in the past, I had the chance to uh, co-author two machine learning related publications, one in natural language processing and one in uh, machine learning pipelines. And here at Digit, I get the great chance to combine both areas. Yeah, and we're going to introduce to you what is Digits and what type of problems we're solving. Uh, so Digits is a real-time finance platform for modern businesses. Uh, so we are a tool for business owners and founders uh, to gain real-time insights uh, into their own business and uh, answer mission-critical questions for them. Uh, in the past, they may have to wait you know, a few days up to weeks and months for their accountants to get back to them uh, on their questions. And by that time, it's already too late uh, for their decision making. So here we really strive to deliver uh, those mission critical business insights in real time. Uh, so as you can imagine, we process a lot of financial data uh, as your business happens. And we use Apache Beam with the Dataflow runner to do so. And to distill those meaningful insights, we use machine learning. And inevitably, uh, we use deep learning models uh, to understand uh, the unstructured data and extract meaning from them. Uh, so in today's talk, uh, we're going to give you a brief idea on um, how we uh, combine the two fields of uh, deep, deep learning models and um, Apache Beam and uh, share with you some of our learnings. So as Joe was mentioning, we're using deep learning to solve some of our business problems, but we're also uh, processing the data in Dataflow pipeline. So the big question was like, how do we integrate those rather large deep learning models into our Dataflow jobs? At the same time, we wanted to separate the deployments between our data pipelines and machine learning models so that the machine learning team can independently deploy um, and it doesn't interfere with the deployment of the data pipelines. So we'll introduce a way how we did this in uh, digits and then we wanted to optimize for throughput, the resource uh, resources we use and the parallelism. Just as a baseline where we are at Digit, so we're a heavy Google Cloud customer. We're using Apache Beam and uh, we're very happy about Dataflow on the GCP platform. Um, we use a Dataflow um, based on the JVM implementation. So we're not using the Python SDK for our pipelines. So that's why the integration of TensorFlow is really interesting. There is a, a Java uh, SDK for TensorFlow, um, but we wanted to take advantage of the latest ops, and therefore we couldn't use the, the integration. So in the next um, slides, we're, we'll talk about how well, what we have looked at it um, when we came to the integration of machine learning in, in our pipelines. So option number one was we could have integrated the machine learning models using the TensorFlow SDK, uh, Java SDK. The problem there is the SDK is always a little bit behind than the original TensorFlow implementation. So usually we would have to wait a longer lead time to get to the point where we can use um, new functionality. Um, and at the same time, it was the GPU support back in the day when we looked at it was difficult and we would have to attach the the same machine type to all the workers and to all processes and the the deep learning model is just a small snippet in our data processing pipelines so uh, we would have basically wasted a lot of resources when we integrated gpus also the model size would drive um, the data flow instances so if, for example if we load a machine learning model which takes up two gigabytes in memory or even more then all the the workers would have those constraints um, even though we only use it for this one particular step. Second option is 
Uh, GCP offers its own managed machine learning model serving um, services. Uh, that is an option which runs through the Vertex AI pipeline. And we could submit jobs from Dataflow to the deployed models. The reason why we didn't chose this option was um, um, there was a limited, back in the day when we looked at this, there was a limited model size. So there was a constraint up to like 512 megabytes or maybe uh, 1024 megabytes. And that sort of like constrained the model architectures what we could use. And we were limited of like using certain um, modern transformer models, which we use at digits. There's also, uh, there were limited uh, optimization options. So we couldn't really tweak all the parameters in TensorFlow Server in which we wanted to tweak. And there was a limited batching support, which looks really interesting to us. Um, at the same time, we have this principle that um, all the network architecture is zero trust. And so we couldn't really um, make sure that the SSL certificates we would use are being treated up to the very endpoint and not just like terminated at the local answer. So that's why we chose option three, which is basically hosting our own intensive serving instances. And we do this in our Kubernetes cluster. Um, we have a setup here where we uh, deploy our TensorFlow serving. Um, the entire machine learning model deployment is fully automated. So when we have a new model, model version, we just uh, version control this as soon as the, um, the commit is um, approved and merged, it will trigger a redeployment and will update our Kubernetes environments. Um, next slide, please. Uh, on the, so with this option, we have full control of our TensorFlow serving setup and um, it works with a zero trust network. Um, we can also then support zero, um, server side and client side batching, which is really attractive, and we'll talk about it uh, later in, in a later slide. So then, how do we talk? Uh, let's talk about briefly how we deploy our machine learning models. Sorry, Joe. Maybe do you mind taking over? Um, there's a lot of noise in my background. Sign here. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So now. Um, this is how we, we decided that we're going to go with uh, TF serving uh, deployed on Kubernetes um, clusters, and we're going to deploy them ourselves. We're going to treat it just like yet another microservice uh, that we develop on Kubernetes, and uh, it's going to establish gRPC connections with our data flow workers, and uh, just for the steps that do need to communicate to the model, um, and uh, we also uh, configure can configure the thread settings for uh, TF serving depending on the model type and uh, what it really needs, um, and uh, depending on you know how fast the product requirements, uh, we can also determine uh, the number of replicas that we really need uh, for that particular model. Uh, so now that we have a TensorFlow serving model running in Kubernetes uh, as a service. It opens up an endpoint uh, for anything to communicate with it. How do we integrate this into uh, the rest of our data pipeline? Uh, so here are some requirements uh, that we first just jotted down on the list. Uh, we need to call to this model for predictions in both a uh, batch and streaming mode. Uh, we need our model prediction uh, rate to satisfy our service level agreement. It cannot slow down any existing data flow pipelines, and it needs to be fast enough to really deliver that real-time promise. Uh, so, which implies that we're going to use batch inference, and uh, we need options to scale out our data flow workers uh, as a number of data uh, we process scales. Uh, so, another product requirement is we want to do a holistic quantitative evaluation of the model before we roll it out. Uh, so that we can make a go, no go call before we flip it live and um, ship it to the customers. Uh, so as a very small and lean uh, engineering team, we want to iterate on our ideas really fast. Uh, so this is also a requirement here. Uh, we also want a very flexible model versioning strategy so that we can dark launch, we can do our evaluation and roll back to canaries as needed. Uh, so here's is a the service diagram. Uh, this kind of illustrates the networking uh, between various services um, in production GCP environment. So we here we have a few data flow jobs, and uh, we have a number of workers configured to run this job. Uh, they have the data sync. Uh, they communicate with 
uh, Google Cloud Storage and Spanner as input and also as out output, uh, depending on the nature of the job. We have our TF serving ML models running Kubernetes. Uh, they are fronted with a load balancer and depending on the nature of the model, how big they are and how fast they need to uh, enable the predictions, we have a variable number of pods configured with the models. And uh, the data flow workers will communicate uh, to the TF serving model via gRPC connection. Uh, so for the next few slides, we're actually going to uh, offer up some of the solutions that we had and uh, some learnings that we had along the way. And hopeful, hopefully this will be uh, helpful to you as well. Uh, so on the code integration side, uh, so we really want to version control our deployed models so we can do uh, easy canary and rollback. So TF serving has version labels uh, it feature. It actually enables uh, uh, this requirement really, really well. On top of that, we also developed our own active version management. Uh, so you can imagine that uh, there might be multiple versions of the same model running. Um, and uh, while you know the customers are like directly uh, um, fronted with one version of the model predictions, uh, the other version is actively doing things in the background. Uh, so we use the model version management to pick uh, which active version uh, we should be using, should be uh, serving the customers, and use the other canary version for the holistic quantitative analysis of the performance um, across different versions of the model. Uh, and the next integration um, uh, learnings that we had is it's you know really good to codify the best practices in shared libraries. Uh, so here at Digis, uh, we deploy a few kinds of machine learning models. We have the classic uh, classification types. We have label sequencing machine learning models, uh, as well as uh, embeddings extraction. Uh, so for each type, uh, we have kind of a shared library uh, that already uh, have configured different parameters uh, that you can fine tune. Um, and really, it really pays off to invest in these shared libraries up front. Um, and the next thing that we uh, learned is it's really useful to separate uh, the model predictions and the consumptions of those predictions. Uh, so what I meant by that is it might be like two or more different jobs uh, that are responsible for producing what the model predicts. And uh, it's up to other jobs to, to figure out how to use them and finally, you know, serve it to our end customers. So separating these concerns really helps uh, that enables us to evaluate the model performance regardless of what the user is eventually going to see. Uh, so the next learning is around uh, batching. So as Hannes mentioned uh, earlier, that TF serving uh, so offers the client side and uh, and server side batching. So server side batching is usually uh, used a lot for online inference. So for example, if the user is uh, requesting uh, is doing something on in our product, uh, they make a user RPC, and uh, the, the user RPC would be dispatched to the TF serving. Uh, models for predictions. Uh, so you can configure a server-side batching to make sure that um, uh, your server is not DDoSed by, you know, the, uh, you know, a, a, an accidental like influx of user requests. Um, and uh, we, so for the communication with data flow jobs, uh, we use a lot of client-side batching uh, in both streaming and batch jobs. So for instance, we would like to send a batch of 100 28 inputs to the CTF serving model for predictions. Uh, so we're at Beam uh, Summit after all, so I decided to show you some code that we wrote. Uh, so the, the code here is uh, Kotlin, which is a very popular and expressive JVM language. Um, so in this example, uh, we prepared some, um, yeah, we prepared some model inputs uh, so, and we would like to batch them in the batch size of 128. Uh, so in order to do grouping to batches, uh, which Pablo had a talk about in yesterday, and that was really wonderful. Uh, so we need to like first produce uh, a key value pair. So in this case, we're just kind of artificially making up a key of, of one, um, and then group them into batches of 128, uh, take the values, 
and then make uh, the, this batch of 128 uh, model input um, to make a request to our uh, TF serving model. Uh, however, what we find out is this actually didn't even scale up to all the available workers uh, that we had. Uh, so it actually just stayed at the one worker and a, and the rest of the data flow job went very slowly. So while debugging this, uh, we realized that this might be the reason is um, when mapping this to a key value pair, we give it a static key of one, uh, which means uh, which kind of like triggered a fusion optimization of data flow. So, you know, data flow is trying to not scale out all the workers for this step. Uh, so to circumvent this, uh, we did a trick here where we kind of spread out the keys into random ones uh, before we group them into batches. Uh, so this really helped us uh, re to really utilize those number of workers. And as a result, our job successfully auto-scaled. Uh, so, and then the next is we have a lot of parameters to tune here about your job, both on the server side, uh, on the on the TF serving machine learning model side, and also on the client side in data flow. So a few different, so we, we figured it's best to kind of um, enumerate a, a lot of these options that we have and record our observations in order to achieve that optimal throughput so that our job can finish uh, in the optimal time. So here we have uh, several knobs to tune here. The number of pods for the machine learning uh, TF serving model uh, in Kubernetes, uh, whether to use startup bundle in Beam uh, to try to kind of batch uh, establish those connections with the TF serving model, uh, whether to randomize keys and then how many do we spread out? How many randomized keys do we spread out? Uh, for the uh, for the grouping to batches, uh, the number of the max number of workers that we can we allow to scale up to on the data flow side, uh, the batch inference side that we want to send to our TF serving model, and uh, on the other end we would monitor the pod utilization for machine learning models in Kubernetes. Uh, so obviously, like uh, this table is going to look very differently for each model. Uh, and um, that is something that we did. Uh, so in order to fine tune our uh, model performance and data flow performance. Uh, so here are a few other learnings that we would like to share is um, uh, data flow batch size and the model request batch size need to go in tandem. Uh, if uh, you're, you're trying to give like a batch of 150, whereas uh, you, the, you're trying to send like a batch of 128 to the model serving endpoint, uh, you might encounter an index out of bounds exception. Uh, so we have to choose our cluster size wisely based on the model complexity and product requirements. If uh, the product requirements is this job only needs to produce uh, new machine learning predictions every day, and if it runs for 10 hours, that's probably acceptable. And you don't really need to throw more resources onto your job to make it go faster. Uh, whereas if the job needs to run in real time and you, users need to get predictions in real time, or the job needs to run hourly, you know, a two, a six hour time frame is really uh, not acceptable in that scenario. Uh, we also need to scale our data flow workers uh, according to the Kubernetes spots. So the sweet spot that we discovered uh, for large models like BERT is usually a three to four X um, number of workers on the data flow side is the sweet spot. And eventually, you know, every case is going to be different depending on your product requirements and the model that you use. Uh, we need to identify the best pipeline parameters for the job uh, through iteration. Uh, so like uh, the pre in the previous slide that we showed you uh, a comparison table. With that, um, I hope you, could, you were able to see that the separation between the machine learning side and the data engineering side makes a lot of sense. So the, data, the machine learning team can deploy and update the machine learning models independently from the pipelines. The investment in the shared libraries has paid off for us and the, the development of a versioning strategy for Canary rollback and cross-version performance evaluation helped us to investigate our models further and uh, to experiment also with different model versions. 
And then at the same time, we were able to sort of separate the concerns for model predictions from the model prediction integration. However, it is, um, it's important to stress that the development of the model took almost the same amount of time or the, the integration of the model took the same amount of time than just the development of the model itself. So that's sometimes often, uh, that's often overlooked how long it takes to integrate the model and to do the experimentation Joe was talking about. With that, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, if you're interested in what, we, what we're doing, uh, feel free to take a look at our website or follow us on Twitter. And if you want to join the team, uh, we're hiring and we would love to talk to you.